Rich, welcome back. I think we spoke uh, towards the beginning of COVID about your micro solidarity program. Yeah, it's good to be back here. Thanks, David. So, yeah, today we're talking for a couple of different reasons, one of which is sort of we're kind of taking stock now, kind of we're coming to the end of 2020. This has been a hell of a year for a lot of people and sort of sensing into what's changed, what's what's different, what are people and we were talking offline about kind of how you're finding a lot more people getting interested in uh, community maybe sort of taking stock of their lives, maybe thinking they want something different, maybe partly because they don't need to be tied to a certain place anymore, like all of these different factors. And I know why I thought it'd be really good to speak to you is that you've been on a really interesting personal journey around community, like why community works, why community doesn't work, why it fails. And I'd love to hear, like, where are you feeling things are at right now? The view that I have, right, where I can see one part of the system, it does seem like there's this massive moment of opportunity and interest and readiness to change what our lifestyle looks like, you know? So um, there's the, there was the first wave of, huh, you know, this kind of instantaneous realization that a lot of us can work remotely, that there's a lot of organizations out there that we're actually completely ready to just throw the switch and not have an office anymore. Um, and that was really surprising. You know, I sort of thought that was a few years away, but it's like, no, a lot of us are ready to go right now. And at the same time, you've got people, I don't know about you, but I've had a really isolated year, you know? It's like, I'm in this apartment with my partner and there's not a lot, <laughs> there's not a lot going on. It's, I really am feeling like, whew, there's only so much connection I can get through Zoom. Um, and, and I think a lot of people are having that experience and feeling this pull of like, oh, who are my people and where's my place, you know? So I'm, I'm seeing this really, yeah, it feels like a, from my perspective, it feels like a really massive move towards, uh, intentional communities or more experiments in like co-living, um, like, can we get out of the city and go? So you can, I know a lot of people at the moment that are moving to Portugal, you know, and um, maybe we can live with 10 people or 50 people and, and experiment with a different way. That seems to have been catalyzed in the last few months um, that people are really, yeah, been given this moment of reflection, right? Like, what's going on in the world? What does my lifestyle look like? Am I satisfied? And I just think the balance has really shifted so that people are suddenly there's a lot, I mean, there's a lot of people that have been for years in the work that I've been doing that I've encountered people that have had this like vague vision in the future. Wouldn't it be nice to live with a few families and we'll have some land and, but suddenly they're all doing it now. That, that seems to be really new for me. Mm. Yeah. And I, I think I want to throw in the, the curveball at the beginning. Um, Cause I think it'll send us in an interesting direction. I mean, you and me in London, I'm always sort of, in and around people who are doing like conscious communities or conscious house shares or whatever. And I, there's always been something about it. Like I, I love the idea of living um, in a community with people who, for example, make um, are all doing the same maybe spiritual practice or oriented towards growth. So the idea of it has always attracted me, but the reality has ended up being something that's been completely off-putting often the kind of people that are attracted to it are not always the kind of people who necessarily have the skills or the techniques or the ability to surface into personal tensions, to be able to kind of do the work to... So I love the idea. The reality is something that I, I've rarely seen work. Um, I agree. <laughs> I, I share that experience. I think um, there are a lot, like I said, there's a lot of people that have this vision um, but when you actually see the experiments in practice, a lot of them are not super appealing. Um, so there's some good ones, but there's also a lot of, there's a lot of struggle, you know, I think it's about, um, often what's happening there is that people are trying to kind of bootstrap a new culture. And that's a really, that's a massive challenge. And there's not really many very good textbooks or guidance or like, okay, you, oh, that's what you're doing. You're trying to invent a new culture. Are right? you were like, here's the instructions. Like it's, it's a process of discovery and that discovery is a lot, uh, <laughs> a lot of that's a real messy, 
a messy road. I mean, my my own personal objective in it is like the way I think about it is the difference between a commune and a neighborhood. I'm much more interested in living in a good neighborhood than in a good commune. This the distinction being that you have privacy, you know, that you have um, a fence and and a, a door, and you 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 decide who comes into your house, you know, but you don't decide who moves in next door. Um, that there's this openness, there's this uh, kind of spontaneity and emergency. You don't know who's going to show up in your neighborhood, but there are some neighborhoods that you go to in different parts of the world where you feel like, ah, oh, yeah, there's something going on here that um, feels like a good place to be. Like in in Wellington, in New Zealand, where I'm from all of my peers were living in shared housing, but it was like, we'd have five people living in the house or six people living in the house. And we have a whole network of these houses and that creates this neighborhood, which is extraordinary. You know, like the, the depth of that social fabric is excellent, but the, each, each unit is small enough that it's um, manageable. You know, you can actually kind of sort yourself out into, I'm, okay, I'm with these people and we, we kind of understand each other and we get on, we have similar values. Um, and you're not forever getting stuck in these conflicts and dramas and so on. And when things don't work out so well, you can just move, you know, you can go to another one because it's not, um, it's more modular. There's more ability to, to migrate between different places. So that's, that suits me better. Um, but nonetheless, I think there's still going to be a lot of people that are more interested in the commune model. And that might be 50 people or 200 people. And I, yeah, I'm not personally advocating for that model, but I see people heading in that direction and I want to kind of help them like, to anticipate, yeah, there's a lot of ways that these community experiences and experiments go wrong. <laughs> and we don't all have to keep reinventing the wheel, like we can learn from each other. Um, in a minute, we'll come to your, your work, your micro solidarity work, which I think you've kind of talked as a kind of training program for creating community. But just before that, it does seem that there's something around at the moment. I think about uh, Jordan Hall has been talking about his Civium project and then a few other people that we're kind of in, in connection with are also looking at like the idea that kind of that social architecture, that kind of cultural architecture of where we're living, how we're living, um, and maybe that the city was, is something that maybe we've, we've started to outgrow. Um, there was a reason to be in the cities because it was sort of, com it was um, about a sort of critical mass of, of people with different interests and kind of brain power and all in one place. And that became a very um, creative environment. It, are we still in that same position? Do we, are we still kind of limited to that? So I guess there's something in the, in the zeitgeist at the moment about whether we're, yeah, what, what are the architectures underneath the, all the other architectures that we're looking at? My sense is that the economics have really changed. Um, so that like the ec economic reason for me to be in a city is no longer there, uh, which is, you know, I need a job and I need opportunities and I want to meet great collaborators and I want to, you know, feel like I'm connected to something exciting. Um, I mean, I've moved from New Zealand to Europe because of the time zone. That's, you know, I'm here because it's easy to, co to collaborate with people during the daytime hours, not because we're physically close together. Um, that's important to me, but they're actually being in the same physical location as not. And it's just like so striking to me with my work with organizations, how many of them have just like embraced at least for multiple years, we're going to be a remote first company. We're just like, we're going to have to deal with that. Um, and I, I'd be really surprised if, if a lot of them go back, you know, there's so many advantages to working remotely. You get access to a global talent pool um, and the way of working is really different. And I think uh, a lot of people will find that there's, yeah, opportunities for actually much better collaboration, much more productivity um, by having your own private space. That's, that's gonna take a while for people to get there, but I really do believe that that's the destination. Um, and that's only one of the things that cities are good for, but it's a pretty um, significant one and deter people's, you know, for people to make decisions about what their life looks like, where am I gonna get a job? It's pretty high on that list, right? Um, mm -hmm. And if the answer is anywhere you want, um, I think that's just gonna change what society looks like. And can you talk a little bit about your, your journey with collaboration, with community and what you've seen work, not work and why you've made it a focus of your life? Yeah, that's a really uh, enormous, enormous stack of questions. I'll try, I'll try and say something useful. Um, I guess in one place that we can pick up that story is 2011, you have Occupy Wall Street 
uh, the Occupy movement reached all the way down to New Zealand where I'm from and I got involved with that movement and um, had this first experience of, first of all, like finding other people who shared my sense that uh, this civilization as we know it is over. Like I'm hopeful we get another one, <laughs> you know. Um, I'm not confident that we will, but that's my hope. But this one really seems like doesn't have much life left in it. I met other people who shared that sense with me. Um, and they also shared the sense of like, and the solution to that is not to make demands of institutions, but to take responsibility for our own life and, and to live in a different way. And that was like unbelievably inspiring for me. And yeah, I mean, we, when you ask about the shortcomings of community, there's lots we can talk about with the Occupy movement. Um, but it was personally transformative. And coming out of Occupy, I just had the really good fortune of being introduced to the people from Inspiral. And from the outside, those are very different things. Occupy being this very radical, like anti-capitalist activist movement, and then Inspiral being social enter enterprise network, you know, like um, people in business that are trying to use business to do something positive in the world. Uh, it was something I'd never really heard of before, never really thought of before. Um, but yeah, I got lucky. I met them at the right time and they welcomed me in and I found a community of support that was uh, really, yeah, unique because they're at this intersection between idealism and pragmatism. You know, like we've got this vision about what's wrong with the world. We've got this vision about how it could be a lot better, you know, that we could create a context that was enabling many more people to thrive, that we could live in a much greater harmony with the rest of nature and so on. Um, and very pragmatic, like, okay, great vision. What are we doing this week? Like, what's the job in front of us? And, um, and in that, you know, Occupy was this kind of like moment of activation and then it passed. Whereas Inspiral was a sustained, consistent, it was a place for me to belong, you know, and I've been there nearly 10 years now and it's provided me this, uh, yeah, extraordinary support in my own development, you know, like in my growing up uh, to becoming hopefully a better version of myself. That's been, it's been the, like the primary source of my uh, meaning, purpose, belonging, growth, like I've gotten it from that community. And that's so extraordinary. And I can see like, as I get older and I see other people my age, like what a difference it's made to me and, and how there's uh, a lot of the people I encounter are looking for something like that, you know, that, that there's a, a community of support where people have some kind of values and they're pushing each other to embody them and live them more strongly. And um, yeah, feel like they're contributing some, that, that, that our work is meaningful, you know, that we're, we're doing something that actually makes a difference in the world, that we're not just accelerating a, a ship in the wrong direction. So that um, is so immensely valuable to me and I get a sense that other people want it. So then that kind of gave me this slowly developing design challenge of like, okay, how do we make more in spirals? You know, like how do we, um, if people want this community of support and belonging, where do they come from? What, um, what goes wrong and, and where do we start? And all these sorts of questions. And so that, that's been my research project for the last couple of years. And um, I guess that started with traveling and meeting with um, decentralized organizations, highly collaborative communities, and, and yeah, trying to understand the pitfalls and, and make a kind of survey of like, these are the common problems, like around conflict, power dynamics, decision-making, stuff around money, accountability, you know, like all these kind of things that tend to go wrong, like understand those problems and what you can do about it. And now this, this next phase that I'm on is, um, yeah, it's come under the micro solidarity umbrella of like, okay, it's time to start a lot of communities with a different set of norms, with a different, um, yeah, with a seed that hopefully is gonna send us in the right direction. And that's, yeah, that's where we get to now. I'm, I'm happy to dive into much more depth than any of those facets though. Yeah, yeah, I'd like to, to hear what micro solidarity is, like you've ended up with this as your focus what are those norms or what is the, what, what's the, the pitch for the process? Um, it's, it's emergent and I'm discovering it as we go. I originally, when I, I published a, a long blog post about micro solidarity and it, originally it was just, Hey, me and my partner, Nati, we're starting a community. This is how we're doing it. Um, we'd love your support and enthusiasm. You know, it was kind of like a document just saying, announcing some intentions. 
And immediately it got this kind of resonance and, and a really warm reception from a lot of people who said, hey, we're also doing this and um, you're giving us some useful language to describe what we're already doing. And so it went from a plan for one community to kind of a, a set of language to describe an approach to building community um, and a set of practices. And the practices are, um, I guess the sort of theoretical side is this view of groups and treating groups of different sizes as being distinct organisms that need distinct treatment. Um, so I, I look at groups from, at, at kind of different scales. So at the smaller scale, you've got me, you know, the self. And I've been informed by internal family systems and other uh, theories and uh, therapeutic practices which treat the individual as a group, you know, that, that say like there are different characters, there are different parts of me and they have relationships between, those different parts have relationships between them and um, and there's some kind of parallel, there's some kind of metaphor between the relationships I have between the parts of me and my relationship to you. So if the objective of this community building work is how do we be better in relationships, I can actually start practicing on my own, you know, so like um, maybe to make that a bit more concrete, like I don't want to um, admit that sometimes I'm anxious and depressed and I feel lonely and lost and, you know, like I want to just kind of like push that part out of um, my vision, just but oh, no, I don't have any anxious parts, they don't exist. But I do. Sometimes I am anxious, sometimes I am depressed. And if I can't accept that part of myself, like if I've got a really um, unhealthy relationship with that part, when I notice it in you, your anxious part, I'm also going to reject it. You know, I'm not going to be available. I'm not going to be present. I'm not going to be compassionate and kind when your anxiety shows up. Um, so if I can be more accepting of my own anxiety, then I'll probably be more accepting of yours. You know? um, so there's a bunch of work to do on the individual that like we need, uh, if we're going to be effective collaborators, if we're going to learn to be in a, in a you know, you'd say like a non-rivalrous uh, way of relating to each other, there's rivalry going on inside of me already that I need to um, grow aware of. And, um, and I have this kind of picture of personal development that's always happening in relationship. That's like exclusively happening in relationship that the only kind of growth happens um, either in a relationship literally between two people or between different characters within me. And then, um, yeah, when I use the word dyad to describe two people, so that's like, um, Sometimes it's like, you know, it could be a, 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 a partnership like a marriage or it could be like a, a coaching relationship or a therapist or it could be, there's lots of different ways, best friend. Um, but that those those relationships of two, those dyads are really, I mean, I mean, it'd be interesting to hear your story. My story of where I trace back where have been the big breakthroughs in my life. It's always been there's someone else there, you know, that's like held the space for, for my transformation to happen. So I'd love it. I'd love to be in a world where everyone has, loads and loads of these dyads that are really supporting them to grow. And then the third stage I call the crew and the crew is like a dinner table size. It's like, I mean, I'm biased towards making it smaller and smaller every time someone asks, but maybe it's like five people or six people um, where you have the opportunity to practice lots of these dyadic relationships. You have, you, you've got um, enough variety of people that you can start to encounter all of their different parts. And, and you also, it's not just about the relationship. It's also about doing something usually, you know, and it, and it could be a lot of the crews start with something quite low stakes, you know, so like um, we're going to take an online course together and we're going to learn about these new practices that I heard about on River Wisdom or, you know, like that there's, there's kind of a, um, a simple but meaningful shared project to start with. And then over time, they might escalate that collaboration. So it's like, um, yeah, we've developed some kind of emotional solidarity, but can we do, I don't know, I want to do a project. I want to run some events. Could we collaborate and, and put an event on together? And, and the idea is that we're practicing and escalating the, the collaboration stakes and, until we're doing really ambitious stuff together. We're maybe starting companies or, yeah, maybe we're starting a co-housing village or something, you know, like we're, we're growing that muscle and growing that appetite for collaboration. And then the final scale that I talk about, I call it the congregation, which is basically a Dunbar, you know, it's like 150 people, maybe it's a bit bigger, a bit smaller, but um, it's the place where people can find their crewmates, where you have enough diversity that there's, and enough kind of bumping space where people can go like, ah, oh, yeah, we have enough sameness and enough, dif enough difference that we can, um, it's interesting for us to form these crews. So 
I have to name all of those different layers because in English, we don't really have sophisticated language to talk about groups, you know, like a group is a group is a group. We don't really, um, we don't have distinctive terminology for each of these stages and uh, the practices that are required to, for excellence at each of those scales are really different. And if we don't have language to talk about it, we're not going to be able to develop much excellence there. So um, I sort of had to establish all of that theoretical framework before I could get into why and how, you know, and the why for me is I want to be in a community where people support each other to do meaningful stuff, you know, where they support each other to have a life that matters, that you feel satisfied at the end of the day, like I'm doing something worthwhile and I've got people who support me and that we've got a history of supporting each other um, and that I know they're going to show up for me. That's kind of why, that's the, that's the destination. Um, but it seems that when people start with some kind of vision like that, some kind of we're going to make this collaborative community. Yeah, like I said, a lot of them don't go that well. And I think it's because we are lacking language and practice. So, so now it's like I think of microsolidarity as an open source R&D network where there's a bunch of communities that have emerged in parallel that are looking across to each other and saying like, okay, this is what we're trying. What are you trying? What's working? What's not working? And we're starting to um, develop yeah, body of knowledge, body of practices for how do we go from these atomized, individualistic, uh, you know, neoliberal, selfish actors to these characters that we can kind of vaguely imagine where we're collaborative, supportive, um, collective, woven into something that's bigger than just me. Like, how do we do that? And there's like a, uh, a reconditioning process, you know, that we were raised in, in one set of social conditions and we're trying to get to another stage and yeah, we're working that out together. And what do you think are the main blocks to that? What are the things that get in the way? This is a really important question, I think. Like, what are the main things that get in the way of us living in the way that we want to live, right? And I think this like whole uh, philosophical and political traditions that have grown out of different answers to that question. Um, so I mentioned Occupy, there was a time where I was a pretty committed leftist. And so my answer would have been, well, the problem is capitalism. And we've got this like um, balance of power between capital and, and labor and da, 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 you know. Um, so with my answer, I don't want to uh, yeah, I don't want to squash other people's answer to that question because I know it's really important to them um, that there are ways of understanding the world that say, ah, oh, this is the key issue. This is the key problem. And we need to prioritize that. And I'm like, yeah, good. I'm glad that your answer is maybe different from mine. Um, but my answer is I'm at the moment and it keeps changing. I feel like I'm navigating closer and closer to what the answer is. But um, one of the answers for me that really has been giving me a lot of inspiration, I guess, a lot of motivation, it comes from uh, Rian Eisler's work on partnership and domination. And her idea is basically that um, both at the interpersonal scale and at the international scale, relationships can be more like domination or more like partnership. So like domination being extractive, coercive, top-down authority, you know, um, and, and, the, and the other half of that being submission and victimization and those kind of things. And then partnership being an acknowledgement of our differences and a, and a way of um, playing to those differences as a strength. And that, like I say, we could do that between us where I can, um, I feel like this was part of my conditioning as, a, as a, a young man growing up that I wanted to dominate, you know, like I want everyone to think that I'm the coolest guy in the room, that um, I'm the smartest, I'm the best, I'm the some, you know, like I, that there's some kind of uh, ranking and I want to be at the top of it. And that's not actually, <laughs> that, that conditioning is not actually very helpful for my um, other needs, like my need for belonging and connection and relationship if I'm trying to outcompete you all the time, it's pretty hard for me to form a meaningful relationship with you, you know? Um, and so uh, it's like, I, I want to come out of that domination training and find a partnership training where it's like, ah, oh, yeah, you're the best at that. And I'm the best at this, you know, we have different strengths and that those can be complementary. So I think, yeah, one of the main obstacles that we have is our conditioning. Um, and that would basically almost all of us, maybe everyone listening to this was raised in a domination culture. And um, from our relationship to our parents, to school, to the workplace, the way that we deal with the state, all of these things are framed 
in a top-down power relationship where there's someone calling the shots and other people that have to conform or face negative consequences. And, and I really believe, and Rian Eisler would argue that it's historically uh, proven that there are also partnership societies where we, the primary relationship is through linking, not through ranking, you know, where we're, we're like weaving these connections and understanding that we're all different and not expecting sameness, but that, um, that we do have some kind of equal access to, I don't know, dignity, voice, um, you'd say sovereignty, you know, that everyone's sovereign, that there are some things that we do hold in common, that everyone, every individual um, is equally important in some important way, you know. Um, and that's a conditioning thing. We've been trained for one way. And then, you know, all of my life, I was trained to be in this top-down way, in this domination way. And then you get a group and say, we're going to collaborate. And I can't just switch my conditioning off, you know, like I can't just, um, yeah, stop being competitive, stop trying to dominate, stop trying to be manipulative and, and kind of um, running things to my own advantage. Like this, <laughs> that's a process that that's a, a developmental process that takes time. And so that's how I see it is that we've got to, um, we, we were raised for one way of being, and now we're kind of reparenting ourselves to be a different way. And that's the main obstacle that I see. And I think we're doing it, uh, like I say, not just on our own in relationship, but that we're in a society, in a culture that is like trying to get to a place that doesn't quite exist yet, or only ex it only exists in these tiny little pockets. And we're, um, so we're hampered, not just by our own personal individual story, but by the collective stories that we're in as well. So we're like, there's a whole lot of us now in the world that are like, oh, oh, can we, we're trying to get somewhere, but we're a little bit stuck. And there's like, we're trying to get somewhere together. I wonder if you could talk about some of the practices some of the techniques that you think are particularly good for creating micro solidarity? The ones that we lean on most heavily are quite simple. Um, and it's a trick to find what are the simple ones that really make a difference. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful it might be that simplicity on the far side of complexity, you know, that someone's gone through the process and discovered like, ah, yeah, this is a little technique that actually makes a difference. So, um, Probably the most simple and impactful one is uh, always starting a meeting with the check-in. The check-in being a moment where people say, everyone in the room gets to announce how they're feeling or like what are they arriving with or just what's going on. And um, so basic and uh, so powerful to signal like, hey, it's in some way everyone's voice is important. And it's not, it might not be that we're all talking all the time and that's like a co-created agenda or something, but that we are... Um, yeah, like it's important that we hear your voice. It's important that we know how you're showing up. And um, for people that haven't had that experience, I, you know, there's a lot of us, I'm sure, like the stuff that you do with your community and, and the people that, um, that we're sort of familiar with, like a lot of us are familiar with doing check-ins. It's like kind of a normal practice. But for people that are not used to doing that, it really makes a difference. I always hear that report when we're working with more like traditional organizations. Um, and then from there, yeah, it's a lot of it is about cultivating self-awareness. Like, I mean, the check-in is a self-awareness practice too, right? It's like, how are you feeling? You've got to sort of notice and then, and then give a name to your emotional state. Um, so there's self-awareness around, uh, that's in a group context. Maybe you've got a meeting with 20 people or something and you will hear for each other first, but in the one-to-one -one space, um, being more, you know, like increasingly curious about the experience of the other person and uh, being supportive of their inquiry so that they can um, excavate just a little bit more. Like, I think there's something, you know, can you tell me more about that? And why is that important to you? And like, what's at stake here for you? Asking these more curious questions and getting deeper and deeper. Um, it's a process of like, just gradually escalating intimacy, you know, that, that um, part of the domination conditioning is you have no weakness, you are strong, you're complete, you know, um, and it takes a lot of us, for some of us, it takes a lot of practice to come out of that habit and to actually be more able to just be like, hey, look, this is what I'm dealing with. This is what's going on. And a lot of us find that naming it out loud makes a big difference. You know, it takes the weight off and it, and it um, makes it more manageable and it makes it less overwhelming. It's more like, oh yeah, that, you know, 
like I said about my anxiety. I, that's a thing, you know, that's not all of me, but that's part of my experience. Um, so that's, you know, that's generally in the, in the whole territory still of talking about your feelings and <laughs> being curious about your interior experience and vocalizing it. Um, then there's this whole uh, set of practices called liberating structures, which is a like a um, collaboration framework, I guess. And there's a lot of good stuff in there. And it's just like, the idea with liberating structures is it's a set of facilitation techniques for just playing with different dynamics in a group. So there's one that we do a lot uh, called Troika Consulting and you have three people and it's like one person is asking for advice and then the other two people are, yeah, telling them, telling them some advice about the challenge that they're facing. But there's just some like kind of specific timing and formats that guide you through that in a, in a way that, um, yeah, tends to generate insight, tends to generate connection. Really similar to that one, I really love the case clinic process from Theory U. Again, Theory U, massive big framework, massive big whole school of thought, really um, some really smart stuff in there, some stuff that I'm like, hmm, I'm not so sure about. Um, but the case clinic process specifically, it's like an hour long focused peer coaching where you have one person in the hot seat who's dealing with a challenge and the rest of the people might be three, four, five people are putting a lot of attention on them and saying, okay, tell us what's going on. And they, they'll be asking a lot of questions and um, helping them to reframe and get a new perspective on what's going on. And again, that one practice um, so reliably produces insight and connection. It's like at least 90% successful in my experience of, of, of establishing a meaningful contact with another person. And if, yeah, when, when we uh, find new crews just starting, just pollinating, you know, just having that first encounter, we often will tell them like, okay, there's five people, do that case clinic five times, you know, everyone take a turn being in the hot seat and then on, then have a sixth conversation. And that sixth one is a retrospective where you look back on those first five and you say, what was good about that experience? What was not so good? And what, what would we do differently next time? And that's the other practice, right? Is, is this practice of retrospective, this practice of structured reflection, noticing what's working, being able to say like, this suits me and this doesn't suit me. And, and can we experiment with a little different thing and making intentional commitments that are, um, contained like yeah we're going to do like I say we have six conversations and that's the commitment here um, so those are some of them I mean maybe you can hear in my tone of voice it's like these are my favorite rants and they're starting to like <laughs> there's a lot of it in there so Rich you and your partner Natty are going to be coming in and doing some of these techniques uh, for the rebel wisdom community starting fairly soon I will put the details in the show notes for this conversation and one of the reasons I'm really excited about you guys coming in is this, this is something we've been trying to do since the beginning, since we really sort of ramped up the community, since pretty much since the beginning of COVID, we've, we've invested a lot more time and a lot more energy into it because there's been a real need and a real desire for it. And one of the things we're really trying to crack is how can we uh, create a community that is really participatory, really self-starting, where people can kind of come up with an idea and then go away and create a small crew with other people with a similar idea, that kind of thing. So, so really the, the frameworks that you guys are bringing, I think are gonna be really important uh, for people to kind of learn some of these skills. So um, can you talk a bit about what we're gonna cover in those sessions? We've got four sessions coming up over the course of just over a month, I think. I mean, the, the practices, are, the calls are gonna be focused on practice. Um, we can have lots of interesting conversations, but that's not really the point, it's like, getting the lived experience of what is it like to experiment with a different way of communicating and being more curious about the other person or being a bit more vulnerable about what I share. And um, yeah, having the opportunity to encounter a lot of relationships in quick succession so I can look at relationships, you know, and go like, oh yeah, uh, I, 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 these are some of the ways that I show up when I encounter a new person for the first time. Um, and so that's about the self-awareness thing that I mentioned. Um, and yeah, we're going to host a bunch of practices which are designed to create connection, uh, hopefully generate a little bit of insight. And also, uh, like I mentioned with the case clinic, for instance, where it's really starting to get focus on people's real challenges that they're dealing with or, or new ideas. It doesn't have to be just like a, a challenge as if it's a negative thing, but like an opportunity or I've, I've got this kind of vague concept and, and um, your peers will help you sharpen that up and, and start to figure out, okay, what action you're going to take. Um, so the idea is, the objective I'd like is that at the end of it, um, people will feel equipped to start little experiments, 
with each other, you know, because there's no, there's kind of no shortcut through the awkward dating phase. You know what I mean? Like you have to just, to have a thriving self-organizing community, which is what I hear rebel wants, rebelism wants to be, that there's like a lot of different action happening and it's not being um, driven by the center, but there's just lots of centers, you know, there's just lots of energy happening at different times. To get to that state involves just a lot of um, people taking small risks and failing a lot of times, you know, like, hey, do you want to do this thing? I've got this idea. And then no one answers. And it, and it sucks, you know, like it's embarrassing um, and it feels kind of lonely or whatever. And that's just what it's like. There's just a bunch of missed starts that, and then maybe not just the missed start, but like, okay, we've got some people and we went somewhere and then after four or five conversations, it really felt like the, the energy just petered out and we didn't really, you know, like there's lots of ways for it to go wrong. And what I'm hoping we can do is give people some really practical resources so they know like, okay, well, these are some practices that we can try and that will give us a, a, what I call a container. You know, it's like we know what we're up for. We're going to try something and then we'll have a moment to evaluate it and see if we like it or not. So there's some, um, you know, it's kind of like scaffolding. You put the scaffolding up before you put the building. So we give you some scaffolding to play with. Um, and hopefully some enthusiasm, you know, just some encouragement. Like, yeah, it's hard, but um, the payoff is really good. The payoff of being in a few small groups that really care about my experience, that check in on me, that care about me, that are um, uh, motivating me to grow in the direction I want to grow. Like the payoff is well worth the expense of the kind of awkward dating phase at the front. Um, so I want to support people to do that. And I also have my own kind of... Um, I mean, selfish is not quite the right word, but I have an agenda of my own, which is like, I'm playing a kind of switchboard role between a lot of these communities and we're discovering together, how do we do this well? You know, like what, like I say, what are the practices that really make it easy? Um, and we don't know the answer yet. So I'm, I'm just like recruiting more researchers who are willing to do some experimentation um, and willing to share back what they've learned so that other communities can learn from them too. So it's like a, for me, it's a, yeah, it's an exchange here, you know. Rebel Wisdom isn't only about the ideas in the films, it's also about how we bring them into our lives, which is why over the last few months, we've invested in developing the Rebel Wisdom community, our digital campfire. We've launched a new platform for discussion and connection, started regular meetups and practice sessions for members, plus Q&As with some of the amazing interviewees we've had on the channel, and our Wisdom Gym with some of the biggest names in growth and transformation. So if you'd like to support Rebel Wisdom to help us continue to make films and to find the others, maybe think about joining the Rebel Wisdom community. Thank you for watching.